we are going to get started. And I'm going to share just a little bit of background information with you guys. Um, hopefully you're all familiar in some form or fashion with the Cotton Board or Cotton Incorporated. Um, but just in case you're not, um, I kind of want to just tell you a few uh, kind of highlights of the differences um, in our two groups. So you've heard from a few of us with the Cotton Board. So the Cotton Board is um, kind of the administrative arm of the Research and Promotion Program. So we're the group that actually collects that per bale assessment on all cotton that's ginned and harvested in the United States. We actually serve as the administrative arm. So we kind of watch budgets, we put things together, put um, projection estimates together. And then we get the fun job, this is my favorite part, of communicating back with our stakeholders what the program is doing. So our regional communications staff, uh, along with our director of communications, puts together our uh, communications plan for you guys as, import, uh, as uh, stakeholders in the program, producers. And then Cotton Incorporated is the arm that actually conducts the research and the marketing for the research and promotion program. So they do a lot of uh, consumer advertising, consumer outreach. They're promoting the cotton products, cotton textiles to the consumers. They're creating the demand and the profitability for your crop. And they're also the ones that are conducting research, whether it's ag on farm research, research with mills, manufacturers or product development. And then we do have oversight and governance from USDA. So we are a um, governmental program. We're subject to things like governmental speak, you know, no disparaging comments. And all of the um, marketing and research that we put out is approved by the USDA. So I've talked a little bit about that cotton board assessment. So I'm sure most everybody on the call is familiar with the producer aspect of this. So we do have an assessment on every bale of upland cotton that is ginned and harvested in the United States. That makes up a little bit more than half of our assessments we collect. Um, but we also collect an assessment from importers. So this assessment is on the cotton content of goods that are imported back into the United States. So many times these importers are mills or manufacturers or retailers, big brands or box stores. And that comprises a little less than half um, of the assessments that we collect. Um, at the Cotton Research and Promotion Program, we pride ourselves on having a very high compliance rate. This is something that really helps us keep a high level budget and really carry out a lot of good marketing and research uh, for you guys as stakeholders. Um, we've had over 99% for several years. And so we're really proud of that. Um, and that's something that's been able to have us, let us have a stable budget in years like 2021. Um, so you can see on the screen, our 2021 budget that we've um, sent over to Cotton Incorporated is gonna be $80 million. This is a decrease from 2020, but because of our great compliance rate, our financial staff um, being really savvy and kind of administering funds appropriately, we've been able to keep this budget at the level that it needs to be. You know, we don't want to, you know, cut back on research in years that we need it. We want to make sure that your crop is profitable, um, even in, you know, a tough year like we've had. So this morning, our call really focuses on our state support research project. So kind of an overview of what this state support program is. So every year, about seven and a half percent of the assessments collected are allocated for this state support project. So these are localized research projects that happen in each state of the cotton belt. They're determined by a committee in that state. Each state is a little different. Um, they may have a committee of several producers, just a few producers in some states. Um, cotton organizations also sit on this committee. Um, but the allocations are determined based on production in that particular state. Um, so you definitely see more um, of this state support funding go into states that have higher production um, during the average in which they're looking at. And of course, a lower rate uh, or a lower production uh, leads to, you know, lower state support funds in that, each, in that state. Um, we also make sure that our cotton board, board members and alternates and cotton incorporated board members and alternates are um, some of the key producers that make up these committees. 
Oftentimes the researchers that are submitting their proposal uh, sit on these committees. And again, some cotton organizational staff sits on these committees as well. Um, in each of the different states that you guys are in, uh, we really rely on these cotton organizational staff to also kind of help us be the administrative arm of the program, if you will. Um, so we're glad to have you guys on the call that kind of help us manage these funds or set up the meetings. We definitely couldn't do it without you guys in each state. And then finally, the research projects are managed by Cotton Incorporated Ag Research staff. Um, so you're going to hear from a few of them today with the different disciplines that they oversee, the different projects out in the West. Um, and they also touch in with those researchers. They'll make sure that the projects are on target um, and they kind of help us with that administrative arm as well. I've listed on the screen um, the different state support committee members um, in your states. And so you can see broken out by California, Arizona, and New Mexico, uh, the different Cotton Incorporated and Cotton Board members um, that we have here. I actually uh, would like to say I've left off a board member that we have in California, I just noticed. So sorry to you, Matt. Uh, he is our new Cotton Board alternate out of California. We're so excited to have Matt on board with us. Um, I will be making that edit as soon as we get off the phone here today. But as you can see, you have some great partners um, on our board that are, you know, sharing your voice with us as we look at these research projects and maybe what's relevant to you or what isn't relevant to you as a grower. That kind of wraps up my segment of the presentation. So we're gonna hear from um, four different uh, researchers uh, with some different topics that are relevant to you guys out in the West, kind of give you an overview of some projects that we um, have you know, targeted to fund with your state support uh, research dollars. And so with uh, nothing else, I will turn it over to Cater Hake with Cotton Incorporated uh, for his presentation. Great, thank you, Christy. Is everything looking, oops, that's the end, my apologies. <laughs> We're gonna go right to the beginning. Um, you can see that I've got a silent co-author on this, and I just wanted to mention that Bob Nichols is looking down and, and still guiding <laughs> the pathology program at Cotton Incorporated. Um, many of you know that, that Bob ran Cotton Pathology for, uh, at Cotton Incorporated for a very long time. And so I'll be talking about largely his program. Um, he is just a wonderful, dedicated scientist who passed away in October. Um, and he, he pushed right to the end, uh, working, working, working. That's what he loved to do. But I also wanted to call out another Bob because the relationship that Bob Nichols had with Bob Hudmacher is really what created the knowledge base that we have with Bucerium Wilt. And uh, Bob, I think you're on the, on the call here. So thank you for being a long-term friend of Dr. Nichols and contributing and really creating much of what we know about Bucerium. So I'm gonna spend the next eight minutes just talking a little update on some of the projects that are going on in Fusarium Wilt Race 4. Uh, but first, I want to let you know that this is a big team working on it. Besides the uh, Bob Nichols and Maggie Ellis in California and Jia Wei Hu in Arizona, Jen Pazang in New Mexico, there are scientists in Texas and Oklahoma that are working on this problem. And I had uh, the good opportunity, I did get out to to see some growers and scientists this year. So this was a field uh, shot I took with Maggie Ellis and her scientist, her, uh, excuse me, her graduate students, co-scientists. And I just uh, did wanna mention that the cooperators uh, were very productive this year, despite COVID and the ec uh, epidemic restrictions. They got a lot of work done. Uh, they had to take separate cars to the field and wear masks when they were with other people but they, uh, my, my hat's off to uh, a shout out to the cooperators that were very productive this year despite a challenging. So we'll t talk a little bit about the, the screening and breeding, culture control, and the investigation on the Fusarium Race 4 that's ongoing. So first, uh, I just got the report from Dr. Ellis at Fresno State for the work that's, uh, that was done this last year. 
And she's starting to look at the interaction of Fusarium race 4 with some of the other pathogens that are out there in the field, because the growers and scientists have seen an interaction with Rhizoctonia solani, which is fairly ubiquitous throughout the, the cotton growing area. And you can see with the, the picture here on, on your left, the, um, the control Fusarium by itself, Solani, Rhizoctonia by itself, and the interaction, uh, how deadly it is. In fact, she commented it's really difficult to get tissue from, uh, from those two. So she's digging into uh, Rhizoctonia a little bit more and seeing that it doesn't do well at high pHs and it really likes warm temperatures. So these co-pathogens, we're trying to learn more about that in terms of the damage of Fusarium race 4. Another area that, uh, that was investigated last year is looking at biocontrol. And we're really fortunate that uh, John Toledo pointed us in the direction of uh, some potential biocontrol, uh, Trichosam. And so that was evaluated at five locations across the U.S. by, um, by Maggie Ellis, but also cooperators at Texas A&M. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, in those trials, they could not see a benefit uh, we'll probably keep looking at it. Um, we, there may be some nuances because I and I need to follow up with you, Jeff, to really understand uh, how your experience went in 2020. But there's another biocontrol that's being looked at that is very, very high tech. Um, the University of, of Tulsa cooperator Akhtar Ali did a sabbatic leave in Japan where he looked at the viruses of fusarium, and those are called mycoviruses. And so he is screening the collection of fusarium race fours that have been collected across the U.S. for viruses inside them. And as you can see with this picture, which is actually tomatoes, because uh, we're not this far along in cotton, uh, the control without the disease. Here's a fusarium wilt with tomatoes. You see the damage. And the mycovirus is able to suppress the fusarium. So biocontrol may be in the future for that, obviously long term, but it would be a, 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 a novel way to control it if we can't do it with breeding. A long a standing role that the extension specialists have played is to help growers understand what's going on in their field. And Bob Hopmacher um, played this role in California. It's also been done in New Mexico. Um, and currently, uh, we're wrapping up a three year, actually, we're going to go into a fourth year looking at fusarium in Arizona, because having showed up fusarium race four in both California, New Mexico and Texas, uh, a lot of interest in why don't we see it in Arizona, uh, three years of looking at fields that are really suspicious. These are the kind of things that Dr. Huttmacher would be uh, concerned about, you know, these bare spots in these fields and this kind of symptoms, but it's not race four. After three years, there's other fusarium wilts that are showing up and a whole bunch of other fusariums and verticillium wilt, but not race four, which is really, really good news because Arizona is a major seed producer of very high quality seed in that area. And I do want to call out the, uh, the, the work of, of Jawa Hugh, uh, also called Alex, <laughs> who uh, just recently put together a very nice publication. Uh, this came out in uh, October of 2020 on Fusarium Wilt. And Christy, let's get this on the, on the website so people can access it because it's a really nice summary. And again, I'm calling out the, uh, the diverse universities that have been involved in helping growers understand what's going on in their own fields. Next, I want to talk about the long-term solution to just about all diseases in cotton, and that is breeding. Uh, the breeding is what provides durable uh, control. You know, we just can't spray our way out of problems, particularly if they're in the soil. Just really, really difficult. Um, and we're losing things like fumigants and aldicarb. Uh, Soil-based products are, are not only expensive, but challenging as well from an application and environment standpoint. 
So a strong role that, that Cotton Corporate has played, both through state support, but also core, is supporting the breeding community. And here I just call out um, three of the breeders. Uh, Jim Olby uh, here has been uh, largely responsible for the creation of tolerant Pima varieties, race four tolerant Pima varieties. Um, and Mauricio Uloa, who the Californians will remember was at Chapter as a USDA breeder, where he also worked on uh, tolerant Pimas. He's working on trying to bring that tolerance in Pimas into Upland and also finding new sources. And Jin Fazang at New Mexico State, uh, who's working on uh, fusarium tolerant both Pimas and Uplands in that area. But also there's a strong program at Texas A&M ongoing and USDA scientists at both um, Starkville and in College Station. So there's a big effort at trying to both identify but also breed fusarium tolerance. The, the last slide is I just want to relate to the, the growers and, and the rest of you on the line um, how close this is to the COVID situation. Um, new diseases in the US, uh, we get really concerned about it. And, and obviously the fusarium, most of you know, it came from Asia into California um, and then it subsequently spread to New Mexico and Texas. Well, COVID uh, has spread throughout the US but also like race four, there's a new race that's come in into uh, Minnesota from Brazil. We don't know a whole lot about it, but it's a very, very dangerous race. And so the role that Cotton Corporate and Cotton Board play is really very analogous to what goes on with a new uh, race, a new COVID race, in that um, we're supporting the local extension specialists so growers can understand if their fields are infected. Obviously, if you have COVID, you want to know if you have it, particularly if you have the new Brazilian or UK or South, uh, uh, South African race. We also need to understand how it spreads so growers can prevent the spread to other fields and other regions. Uh, that's just like the knowledge of, of mask wearing and, and, um, and sanitizing hands, washing hands and surfaces. Um, we also look at, at beneficial therapies, and I, talk about, I talked about the, the biocontrol strategies that are being looked at. This is very, very similar to remdesivir and the wonderful cocktail that President Trump um, took uh, that got him out of the hospital right away. The one thing that's not analogous is we're not breeding humans to be tolerant to COVID, but we are supporting uh, the breeders uh, to create tolerant and resistant varieties to, um, to race four. And really the last thing is just like with these races for the COVID, we've got to be vigilant for new races, mutations in the pathogen. You know, there's one that looks like it's come out of California, maybe a mutation from California. We don't know as much about that as the, uh, the races from the UK, Brazil, and South Africa, but we've got to be vigilant for new fusarium races, um, make sure that they're not more virulent and that they don't spread. Um, with Christy, uh, I'll ha with that, I'll hand it back to you and I'll be around for the whole time. And here's my email address if people want to reach out to me uh, in a little more detail. Thanks, Christy. Perfect, thank you, Cater. We'll be sure to send that uh, information out in the follow-up. I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan Kurtz at this time. Thanks, Christy. Um, I'm Ryan Kurtz. I, I direct the entomology research program for Cotton Incorporated. So uh, what I'm going to go through today is uh, a listing of the projects that are funded through the state support committees in California, Arizona, and New Mexico. So I've got a little uh, chart here outlining who the PIs are, the institution that's funded, the title of the project, and the, the amount of funding uh, that's going towards each of these projects in the state. So we've got Ian Grettenberger, University of California. He's got a pretty diverse program Look at cotton entomology. If you're not familiar with Ian, uh, Ian took over the program from Larry Gottfried a couple of years ago. Jane Pierce is working on seed treatments for thrips in New Mexico. Zin Chun Lee is working on whitefly resistance in Arizona. 
Peter Ellsworth, the extension entomologist there at the University of Arizona is looking at a, a wide range of things to help improve management of various insect pests in Arizona. And then James Hagler recently got funded. He's with the USDA and ARS in Maricopa. And he's got an interesting project on, on uh, the uh, life stages of ligus and looking at predation. So starting with Ian's project, um, it's a really, uh, it's too big to really cover everything that Ian's doing, but what he's really doing is looking at evaluating the efficacy of labeled products, the products they're recommending, new products that are potentially coming on the market, and, and looking at how those products affect key pests of cotton in the San Joaquin Valley, documenting their influence on beneficials, and then examining other factors that are influencing management. And his real emphasis is pests that are threatening quality. Um, he does, he, he has a lot of work going with white flies and aphids, but he also has quite a bit looking at thrips, mites, caterpillars, and ligus. And he's really looking at developing a multifaceted IPM approach to sustain a, an efficient and stable system for pest management in California, keeping in mind that profitability is of, of the utmost importance. Uh, Up-to-date data on insecticide efficacy are in, in high demand and constantly by growers and PCAs. And he's, and he's developing these data on how these different insecticides, both new and, and current, um, are fitting within an IPM program in Arizona. So looking at the, some of the results, um, don't have enough time to go through all of it, but really what Ian's driving at is looking at the big picture of cotton IPM in, in California. And his research is allowing and has allowed and will continue to allow a thorough evaluation of the ac applicability of these experimental compounds and how they fit into the California system before they come onto the, to the market. Um, a critical component of this is it actually uh, promotes the continued involvement of the University of California research system in cotton pest management in California. Uh, this project is, is also providing the necessary support to maintain a research program that's critical for developing and maintaining IPM tools and allowing him to stay abreast of emerging pest issues in cotton. Uh, moving to New Mexico, Jane Pierce recently got funded for a project, project looking at seed treatments for thrips. Um, neonicotinoid seed treatments are critical in controlling thrips in New Mexico. Um, so better defining the efficacy of the various options and then understanding how the various options work on different thrips complexes in different regions is of utmost important. Um, you know, thrips can reduce stand density. Um, cause poor early season crop growth and ultimately delay maturity. So really um, looking at how these reductions vary across the production regions as, as was critical and, and identified by the state support committee to be of high importance for funding. Um, a great way to get a problem to go away is to fund a research project on it. So in, in 2020, the thrips populations were too low to really gather any, any useful data. Uh, she saw that there were slightly higher numbers of thrips in the untreated versus treated plots, but the difference really weren't significant. And the, the thrips pressure was just really too low to make any, any definitive observations. But she, had, she was able to, to collect thrips samples out of every field and in different regions. And so she's really trying to, to analyze those thrips samples, identify them to species, and then determine if there are regional differences in, in the species composition and then possibly learn from that whether the various seed treatments might work better in one area versus another. Uh, moving to Arizona, uh, James Taylor had a project funded. Um, it was actually a really interesting project looking at if he could pinpoint the, the, uh, the types of predators that are feeding on various life stages of cotton. So really trying to figure out which predators, are there predators that are important early season um, feeding on nymphs or their predators that are more important later in the season, feeding on adults. And he was looking at a gut content analysis to, to try to figure out uh, which predators were feeding on which um, um, stage of ligus during the growing season. He developed in 2019, this, this gut assay was developed 
for identifying the life stage specific predation events of, of each of the cotton pests. Um, so that's going to ultimately be really useful for developing a more effective conservation biocontrol program for ligus uh, in Arizona and potentially uh, elsewhere in the West. Unfortunately, COVID disrupted much of USDA's research plans and he was really limited in what he could actually do in the, in the field and in the lab this year. So we had to shift the actual assessments in 2020 to just looking at the effect of irrigation management on the uh, arthropod demographics in cotton. So looking at which predators and which prey were more abundant during the season at different times, and then looking at irrigated and non-irrigated. And he hopes to continue this and the, the, the previous gut assay method. He's gonna continue that in 2021 uh, with USDA funding without the, without the support of, of the state support committee. Another project is with Zin Chun Lee. Uh, the, the essence of Zin Chun's project is a statewide survey of white fly susceptibility to insecticides. It's, it's um, critical that we understand uh, which products are working, which products we're losing efficacy on, which products we're maintaining efficacy for. So this, that's how this product is benefiting, or this project is benefiting Arizona. Uh, I will note that this project is also receiving some core funding to help support this effort. Um, when you're doing a lot of these bioassays for resistance monitoring, a lot of times it's a little bit staggered. So um, they collect populations during a growing season and then rear them to levels where they can do bioassays in the winter and the fall. So Zinchun right now, he's collected populations from 2020. They're being assayed now, but the results from uh, populations collected in 2019 came in earlier this year, looking at um, various products. Some of the resu results show that a sale, Danatol plus orthene uh, resistance levels were actually declining in the 2019 collections. Uh, for both Oberon and Courier, resistance levels remain stable. They're, it's there, but at least for the last year or so, it, it, it was not increasing. Uh, NAC resistance did increase in 2019 populations though. This uh, Zen Chun's project is a good lead in to Peter Ellsworth's project because they're somewhat related. Um, Peter's looking at a more field-based holistic management type approach, approach primarily to ligus and white flies uh, now that pink bollworm has been eradicated. Peter's project is looking at uh, refining and developing decision-making tools for white fly, white fly control and uh, conducting grower co cooperative studies and demonstrations, looking at how white fly movement in the landscape uh, impacts the risk of pest damage and resistance. He's also looking similar to what Ian's doing in California is, is looking at uh, novel compounds and new ways to use products for better and more efficient chemical control and then looking to identify selective approaches to insect management and particularly for ligus. And this is one, one thing I really wanna call attention to that Peter's doing really well. He and his, one of his graduate students developed this chart looking at the various products that are available for white fly control or for uh, ligus control, or I guess really um, for, for uh, uh, green stink bug too. And the way it breaks it down, it's got all the information about the products, the level of control for each of the pests, and then risk factors that you need to keep in mind when you're using the product. So if it's in the green, that means it's fully selective and safe to beneficials. If it's in the yellow, it's a partially selective product. And if it's in the red, it means it's a broad spectrum and, it, and is not safe to, to, to beneficials. It also, in this chart, is just a quick way to look at the, the risk of resistance over on the far right. So whether there is known resistance or whether resistance is, is pending or building. So this is, you know, this is one of the best ways I've seen anybody capture a ton of information that you can, that'll help you make decisions quickly on which products to use in any, any different given situation that you may encounter on your farm. Uh, I also will note Peter Ellsworth, he's probably, uh, I think the, the latest numbers were around 15 either live or virtual field days that he put together this year uh, related to pest management in Arizona. And I wanna call out these three publications in, in particular. This first one, the insecticide use guide is the, the, the one that I just showed you. 
just how to know and balance your risks. They also put out one on false chinch bugs and one on flea hoppers. And you know, rather than just showing the links that are of no use, the quickest way to get at these, and it's kind of a mouthful, but if you Google the Arizona Pest Management Center field IPM crop shorts, that'll bring you right, <laughs> that, will, that will quickly take you right to where you can find all of these publications from Peter Ellsworth. Uh, just a quick note, there are two additional core projects in the West that I'm that I'm funding in particular. One is with Bruce Tabashnik at the University of Arizona. Bruce has maintained a pink bollworm resistant colony for years, uh, just trying to better understand the risk of resistance there. Um, pink bollworm is, is still around in parts of, of Mexico. Um, we're at risk potentially for it to come back. Hopefully it won't, but you, you don't want to it's a pest you don't want to rest on your laurels with. We want to make sure we stay ahead of the curve on, on this. Bruce is also looking at bollworm resistant colonies to, uh, to a broader, more regional um, impact in, in looking at the impact of the new VIP3A protein on bollworm populations. Colin Brent at the USDA in Maricopa has a product project on gene silencing and genome editing for ligus control. This one's kind of a long-term project and I, I've kind of, I have to be careful at weighing near-term projects with long-term projects. This one's really more longer term, looking at how non-insecticidal ways of managing ligus for the future. And any, if you have any questions about any of this, you can contact me at rkurtz at cottoninc.com. And I just wanna make one plug before I, I turn it over to Ed for our cotton cultivated website. Uh, this is a place where we've been trying to collate a lot of useful cotton information. Uh, we've got various resources from around the web that you'll be able to access. This is where you can find the weekly weather video that, that, that covers the entire cotton belt, as well as research and reports that a lot of our, our PIs are funding. And so the quickest way to get there is just Google cotton cultivated, it'll come right up. And with that, I will turn it over to Ed Barnes. Hey, thanks Ryan, I, I appreciate that. Um, get my slides up here. cameras in front of my screen there. <laughs> hey, uh, so I do appreciate your time today. I appreciate uh, Christy letting me join this meeting just to talk a little bit about some of the water projects we're doing there. Uh, before I was with Cotton Incorporated, I spent seven years in Arizona working for USDA ARS at the, at that time it was US Water, uh, US water Lab uh, in Phoenix and it was next door to the Cotton Lab. And then those two got combined into what's now the Arid Land Research Center in Maricopa. So that top pictures there, looking down at Mac before all the subdivisions came in. And then also when I started, Ted Sheely was our, our chairman of our board of directors and he's from California. He wanted to make sure I understood California was a little different than Arizona. So he gave me a tour and that's uh, me in front of the California aqueduct. So uh, anyway, I really uh, enjoy the, the far west. I love it when I get to go back there and do some project reviews. So I'm just gonna cover a few things really quick. Um, one, <laughs> So they're gonna talk about water, I'm gonna start talking about weeds. I got one slide on weeds, just cause I wanna acknowledge uh, an Arizona uh, state support project on some weed control work. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the, the water use projects. Um, on the right here in the far right picture is this uh, finger weeder. And um, Mark Siemens with the University of Arizona, and this started as an Arizona uh, state support project. Uh, we're looking at how effective that was, looking at an advanced control strategy of uh, you know, using RTK GPS versus a camera system that could allow you to get even closer to the cotton. And that actually system has shown that it works pretty well. Uh, been working with Galen Morgan, who's our uh, agronomist here, and looking at having that as a kind of a fail safe system. You know, we think everybody's well aware that we have a lot of herbicide resistant weeds and we don't have a lot of new chemistries. So worst case scenario, you know, we may have to fall back on some tillage. So we just wanna make sure we're ready for that backup plan. Also Galen is working uh, with some of the engineers there at the University of Arizona, you see listed here and Randy Norton, Pedro Andretti and, and uh, on a uh, sea and spray system along with Mark Simons. So uh, just a lot of uh, some good work going there on, on weed control. On the water side, uh, this is an example of where we're trying to use some of our core funds to leverage some federal funding. So Andy French is with the Airland Center there at Maricopa. 
Arizona, and he has a, a, a grant from the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation to look at water use, particularly around Yuma, of all the different crops. And so I uh, talked with Andy, and we're leveraging that, giving him a little bit of money so he can add another site in central Arizona. And what they're doing, uh, you'll see off to the right, this picture, that is a flux station uh, that's placed in the field, and it's called an eddy covariance. And what's it, What's good about these stations is you need a big field to have them in because they integrate a large area. Basically, 100 yards upwind of, of the station is they're kind of averaging all those uh, all the amount of, uh, of water loss that's occurring. And so it's a really good way to, to get a pretty solid handle on how much water use is occurring out there. Um, and what we want to do with this is use it to update what our our knowledge of water, cotton water use in the far west. And so in the 1980s, I'll hold this up, um, this pub, 1982, this is consumptive use of water by major crops in the southwestern U.S. was published. And really there hasn't been a comprehensive update of this publication since then. And so the project Rand, uh, Andy's working on will be updating for all the crops. Uh, and this is good news when we, so what we're seeing uh, from cotton is since the 1982, obviously yields have increased tremendously and we're, we're not seeing any increase and maybe some decrease in the amount of water needed by cotton. So that's a great story for our sustainability program as well as the practical applications for you on your farm. So we'll hopefully use that to update some of our scheduling tools. Another project I'll mention real quickly, um, and I need to get this, uh, Brian called out cotton, and cotton cultivated. I need to add this. This just came out from uh, a collaboration between uh, uh, Kevin Bronson, who is getting ready to retire from the uh, Arid Land Research Center there. He's a long-term uh, agronomist in, in nitrogen. Uh, he's done a lot of work and we've supported him on looking at the interactions between nitrogen and water use in, in the far west. And one of the products of that is a, an, an update to, if you're using petioles to make nitrogen uh, application decisions. He's uh, updated the, nit the uh, petiole nitrate recommendations and uh, computerized it. So if you scan that QR code with your phone or you can type in that uh, web address, it should take you there. It's, it's a little bit Arizona centric right now. They're gonna, uh, it does have the ability to put in some growth stages. So if you're in California, New Mexico, that the, the goal is that it will work across all those areas. So uh, that's a new resource that's just come out. And then finally, I will just uh, talk real quickly about uh, some modeling efforts. Now this is not quite ready for on-farm use yet, but I, I see the day coming in, in less than five years where it could be very valuable. Uh, some of you may remember the Gossam model that was developed in Mississippi in the 1980s. Uh, and they tried to use that model in Arizona, in California, and it did not work very well. And so that resulted in something called CalGoss, which was the California Gossam model. And that model was developed and, and worked much better in the far west and then modeling kind of went by the wayside for a while. Now, some of you are telling me, I got all this data on my farm, what do I do with it? Well, in the 1980s, people, were, growers were telling us, that's too much data, I don't, there's no way I'm gonna put all that data into this thing. So we've kind of come full, full circle now. And so a lot of work that Kelly's doing is with these crop simulation models that will allow us to reduce a lot of this data, maybe combine it with some artificial intelligence, and then we'll be able to take all that data and help you make better management decisions. That's our long-term goal. And so with that, I am going to uh, stop my presentation. I um, and I forgot to put my email up there, but Christy knows how to get me. So uh, I wanna introduce uh, and give plenty of time for Dr. Derek Whitelock at the New Mexico Gen Lab. Um, Derek is getting funding from two sources, from Cotton Incorporated, both our Agricultural Research Division, which you've been hearing from us, and also on the call is uh, Vicki Martin with our Fiber Competition Division. So uh, both our divisions are uh, giving support to Derek on some really important work that's going on there in New Mexico. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Whitelock. All right, thanks, Ed. Um, let me share my screen and uh, we'll see if we can make this work appropriately. All right, hope you guys can see that. Um, so yeah, I'm, Chrissy asked me to uh, give a little bit of update on contamination and gen research, and I'm actually gonna 
focus on contamination research because we don't have a lot of time. And that's a pretty important thing going on now with, with folks. So um, there's, there's quite a few projects that are happening um, across the country. Uh, and this, this is just not just at my lab in New Mexico, but it's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of collaboration among the USDA Ginning Laboratories, also um, with uh, Texas A&M, uh, University of Georgia, uh, and of course, Cotton Incorporated is, uh, is working to um, kind of bring all these together, bring these researchers together so that collaboration continues, uh, bring expertise to the table, and also, uh, of course, with funding. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to concentrate on just a couple of projects in there because we could talk for hours about all these different things uh, and another hour about the other projects we're working on that don't have to do with contamination. Um, but I'm going to focus on a couple of projects that have to do with detection and ejection and then some other projects that are more passive that uh, are looking at machinery to separate uh, the plastic contamination. Um, one of the first projects I'm going to talk about is, is really this kind of this poster child for how research goes uh, with us uh, often. And that's this project. It started in the laboratory with, uh, with looking at bench equipment and then developing uh, ways to prove concept and then moving into uh, pro prototypes that we tested in the lab and then taking them to the gym. And, and that project ended up with a system called the Viper system that detects uh, plastic at the gin stand. Uh, colored plastic, that is. And then it has an ejection system that uses pneumatic air uh, blast to blow that contamination out onto the, the floor in front of the gin stand. And there's a couple of those devices that put in some gins across the country right now. Uh, they're being uh, continued research and, and, and development by Lummis and Bratney companies. I'm just going to show you real quickly how this, how this device works. Here's some, here's some folks testing it at, at one of the gins that it's installed at. Uh, it's actually many cameras across the front of that, that gin stand. Uh, and there's a new mat, there's an air knife at the bottom. So when, when this person, when this young man uh, feeds the plastic in, the guy standing up high there, uh, the, the, the camera sees the detection, it causes the blast of air. And then that little piece of plastic right there you see is blown out of the system. Uh, it works very well. Uh, their results show that it's about 90% 90, 90 efficient for all the different kind of colors of, of round module wrap that we have uh, in, uh, currently. And um, it also takes out some other things that they found at this one gin where it's oper been operating for 2020. Uh, even colored cotton stocks, just about anything that's not cotton colored, uh, they seem to be uh, removing at the gin. And a lot of that stuff, of course, we don't want in our cotton. Another, another project that, that, that's happening, and this is, uh, again, this is, a, this is a collaborative research with uh, gin labs and, and different folks, and that's um, next generation module feeder cameras. Uh, a lot of the contamination, of course, that gets into the gin come, starts at the module feeder. And if we can catch it there, um, that'd be, of course, we can keep it out of the rest of the, rest of the flow. And so they're working on uh, module cameras to, to detect that, that plastic. Uh, here's some images from those cameras that show uh, on the left uh, a live camera feed where you can see there is some plastic there, but it's kind of hard to see. But the system's uh, made to take some still camera shots uh, uh, periodically to help the gender see that if there is plastic on the module feeder or disperser heads. And, um, and they're also going the next step where they're using some of the technology that we developed for the Viper system to actually uh, signal the gender, uh, detect that plastic on the, on the spikes and signal the gender when they need to uh, remove it. Uh, another exciting um, work that we're doing, that they're doing at the Lubbock Lab uh, that's kind of going along with this module feeder system is using an RFI, uh, RFID bridge uh, as we load the modules onto the module feeder to help track potential plastic contamination events. Uh, the way that works is the RFID scanner logs the date and the time when a module is loaded. Uh, and then the camera is running and it, it captures the, the unloading and unwrapping events as it happens. And then if um, perchance uh, there's plastic that ends up on the module, module uh, disperser head, uh, we can uh, go back in time and look at the camera and determine what actually caused that, that plastic, try to figure out the why that was occurring and then give some education, hopefully, to the people that are, that are unwrapping those modules or determine what's the best way to, to alleviate that. I want to move on to some projects that have to do with machinery, and, and these are more like passive types of machinery that uh, work on the, all the cotton there's not really, there's no detection involved, but it's, it's, it's ways to hopefully remove that plastic as we process the cotton. One of those is, is actually a machine that's already in use in China. Uh, cotton Incorporated uh, worked to get this machine for us. Uh, it, they use it to uh, help alleviate their issues with plastic mulch in their fields. Um, 
Here's a picture on the left of that machine installed in my lab in New Mexico. Uh, we've been doing testing on it. It has many different parts to it that uh, try that do different uh, operations to remove plastic. But the main thing is this air uh, cylinder, air chamber in, in the middle here where the cotton comes in, it's blown up by air. And, and it, the idea is that it tries to lift the cotton and the plastic up and, and remove it on a uh, separating cylinder. I'm gonna show you a video here. Uh, so we see here the cotton's coming in and this is our lab. It's being blown up into the chamber. And you see on that rotating cylinder, it's a separation cylinder. Uh, cotton and plastic pieces are sticking to that cylinder and they're being rotated around and, and doffed off into a chamber where we, can, where we can then separate the plastic. So we've been doing quite a bit of, of testing on, on this machine over the last year or so. And um, what we found, first of all, is that this golden line, that's what we call it, um, is more effective than seed cotton cleaners, um, the typical seed cotton cleaners that are removing plastic. So that's good. Uh, there are some limitations. It works really well on light material, uh, like shopping bags and some of the lighter weight round module wrap pieces um, within the manufacturer's claims, which is about 70%. But the thicker, stiffer round module wrap, the stuff that's still three uh, laminations thick, uh, is not effectively removed. So we need to work on that. So we're really investigating ways to improve that performance and see if we can't make this work. And, and this could be a machine, if, if we can improve the performance, that gins could buy off the shelf uh, and not have to wait for further, further uh, modifications or, or uh, research. One of the last projects I wanna, I wanna bring to your attention, this is kind of an exciting one. Uh, we have a, uh, a researcher that uh, thinks outside the box and he started wondering if there are other characteristics of plastics that we can kind of um, look at and see if we can use that to separate plastics from, from cotton. And, and one of the things he thought about was the, was the melting temperature. So he did some, uh, we've done some research in the lab and we found out that the plastic that is typically in cotton melts at about 100 degrees C or the boiling point of water. And that's a temperature that the cotton's not harmed in the gin. So we came up with a proof of concept where we, we have this concept where we looking at uh, having several cylinders and a couple of those cylinders are, are heated by heating elements and the cotton would flow down through those. And as the plastic would contact the cylinders, it would stick to the cylinders, melt and stick. And then we can scrape them off as the, as the cylinders rotate uh, and, uh, and remove that plastic. We built a, a, single, a single cylinder model and we tested it out with some plastic that had uh, in cotton. And we found that it, it does indeed work pretty well. Um, the, the, the plastic really sticks. In fact, it sticks really well. And so we're, we're, we're having to investigate ways to get it off the cylinder uh, without it gumming up a knife. Uh, and, and that's one of the, the big, big things we're working on now. We do have a, a, a larger scale model we're working on right at this time, even with COVID restrictions. You see our, our technician has a mask on there and we're trying to uh, do the multi-cylinder um, um, addition. And that, we're actually gonna be testing that later this spring. And, we're coming up with some innovative ways to, to remove that plastic from the knife it, once it gets gummy and, and hot and it's hard, hard, to, hard to remove. So uh, stay tuned for that and we'll be keeping you guys updated on, on, those, type, on those types of, of projects. I wanna say one other thing, um, you know, we're working on these projects where we're trying to remove the, the plastic uh, in the gin or, or there's projects, you know, looking at the drones in the field and, and what happens to the cotton. I mean, we're, we're looking at all kinds of things, but. Plastic contamination starts in the field. Um, you know, um, if, if we can prevent it from, from getting into the cotton in the first place, uh, you know, take care of module handling and those things, it will go a long ways towards uh, keeping it out of our cotton stream. Um, again, these are projects. There's a lot of projects out there. I have to really give a plug to Cotton Incorporated because not only are they uh, give, handing expertise and funding, but they're also doing a lot of coordinating and keeping us uh, together and making sure that our efforts are not... Uh, you know, overlapping and that uh, we're all working together. So I appreciate the time. And if anybody has any questions, you can always email me. Christy has my information. I would talk to you more about it or, or send you to the researcher that's doing the project itself. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. I know uh, we've had a few different links and resources mentioned. I'll be sure to include that information in the follow-up uh, to you guys following this um, call. I do have one question in the chat um, and it's for Dr. Kurtz and I'm gonna assume I'm gonna pronounce this correctly. How will Thrive On influence the Hagler work in Arizona? <clears throat> that that will be very interesting to find out. And so, Thrive On is the is the BT trait, 
that is um, that will be offered by Bayer. It has impact on both ligus and thrip species. So, you know, I don't think it will, my best understanding for ligus is that this is not going to be a complete control type situation. So it's not similar to what you would see with pink bollworm and BT cotton, for example. Uh, the work they've done in the Mid-South, I'm a lot more familiar with, where it's, it's reducing the number of sprays by about half. So you're still having to make some applications, but it's kind of, a, you know, it's giving you more wiggle room. So I think the work that Hagler's doing actually could complement it very well. So if you can better